are these people? Last week, Care Bear, we covered, well, not last week, a couple weeks ago, right? Um, mm-hmm. We covered the history of Hamas, right? Because clearly most people don't know about it. Clearly, I don't know that much about it as I should. So, could we do some more more history lessons, right? So, Robert and Lakesh, now new Indie Media Award honoree. Um, so, yeah. By the way, know. watch. Uh, so, Indie and Reef uh, released this new class uh, of honorees uh at the yep. Indie Media awards that they premiered on sunday so definitely check that out uh yeah, check you, that out uh, and clips from that stream will be forthcoming but uh robert has i think definitely we've featured a lot of his articles <laughs> over the past year so yep. i think he's definitely well deserving and i think when we talked about it like he was immediately like yes uh yep. so uh, so he definitely deserves it just due to his work, especially his reporting and deep dives in terms of the history surrounding Israel, Palestine and, and what's happening now. So we appreciate you, Robert. Um, we would love to have you on to interview you if you ever do watch this. Um, we would love to have you on and interview you, man, but we really appreciate you. Yep. Did Israel. Well, We'll let we'll let him speak on this matter and and get us started. Um, give you volume and action. Israel really use Hamas to derail the Oslo peace process and kill the two state solution. Well, I'm Robert N. Lakesh, and over a year into the Gaza genocide, the Hamas movement that leads the armed resistance against Israel's assault is still misunderstood. In light of media mischaracterizations, we continue to see Hamas compared to ISIS blamed for Israel's actions, and there are those who even say Israel created and continues to control the group. A few weeks ago, we published part one of this video series where I explained the origins of Hamas separating fact from fiction regarding the funding of the group, its historical climate, and how it emerged as the most popular Islamic party in Palestine. So, in this video, I'll seek to explain what's wrong with the argument that Hamas was responsible, along with an Israeli right-wing fringe, for derailing the so-called peace talks aimed at securing a two-state solution. But, as usual, to address such a question, we have to turn back to history. So, that's what we're going to do. Um, okay. But do go check out our coverage Did of it- his last installation of this. Um, should be able to find that on the channel pretty easy. But he writes, When the Declaration of Principles was signed between the Palestinian Liberation Organization and Israel in September 1993, um, I was like, I was born in March, Colin, of that year. So that I'd, I would have been like a couple months, you know? It marked right. the end of the first intifada. The mass Palestinian uprising brought Hamas to prominence as a political force. Many viewed the Oslo Accords as a beacon of hope, a chance for peace in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. However, the path to failure had been set long before Hamas became a significant factor. To understand why Oslo ultimately failed, we must rewind to 1974, when PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat addressed the UN famously offering peace while upholding the right to armed struggle. This followed the PLO's issuance of a 10-point plan, which many saw as paving the way for dialogue with Israel. Israel's response was to reject what it described as a terrorist group's peace offensive. What? Huh? (laughs) What the hell is a peace offensive, Colin? Like, does that mean to you like no it all sounds like an oxymoron yes to me quite literally <laughs> interestingly israel prime minister yitzhak rabin who had once been labeled the P- who once labeled the plo a terrorist organization would later go on to sign the oslo accords with arafat so what changed care bear what do you what do you think did that well you're going to find out. 
بغصن الزيتون في يدي وببندقية الثائر في يدي فلا تسقط الغصن الأخضر من يدي The Israeli response to this was rejection of what they called a terrorist group's peace offensive, expressed here by Israel's Yitzhak Rabin, who actually would later go on to sign the Oslo Accords with Yasser Arafat. And so you have the statement of the Security Council chairman, which speaks about, the, speaks about inviting the representatives of the terror organizations. So what changed? Well, by 1981, the Arab League had ratified the Fez Initiative, advocating for a two-state solution, which the PLO was ready to consider. How so did you catch that? What's in there? So Israel would draw from all captured Arab territories, including East Jerusalem, the dismantling of Israeli settlements in Arab territories, the assurance of the freedom of worship for all religions, the recognition of the rights of the Palestinians for self-definition, which will be implemented through their exclusive representative, the PLO, a several-month transition period for Gaza and the West Bank under the auspices of the UN, the establishment of a Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital, the guarantee of the UN Security Council for the peace and security of the states in the area, including the Palestinian state, and the guarantee of the UN Security Council for the implementation of above-mentioned principles. So, any questions on what they wanted? I mean, no, but... You... <laughs> right. So... Advocating for a two-state solution, which the PLO was ready to consider. However, Israel's response was not peace, but war. In 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon, forcing the PLO to flee to Tunisia and killing around 20,000 Palestinians and Lebanese. This conflict severely weakened the PLO, diminishing its capacity for both armed resistance and political leadership. As the Palestinian Intifada erupted in the late 1980s, the PLO struggled to take control of the uprising that was led locally inside the occupied territories. During the Intifada, the PLO also lost one of its biggest financial backers, Kuwait, after the PLO sided with Iraqi President Saddam Hussein during the first Gulf War. Meanwhile, Israel faced a public relations crisis. Images of Palestinian youths throwing stones painted a David versus Goliath narrative that Israel couldn't combat. Recognizing the unsustainable economic and security cost of the occupation, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, infamously known as the bone breaker for his brutal crackdowns on nonviolent protesters, finally agreed to a deal with the severely weakened PLO leading to the creation of the Palestinian National Authority. This meant that the administrative and security role in the West Bank and Gaza, in what are known as areas A and B, were taken off the hands of Israel, while the Israelis still maintained their full occupation of the majority of the territories in what is labeled as Area C. Better yet, the Palestinian Authority was funded by the US and EU, making Israel's occupation cost-free and enabling them to allocate their military resources elsewhere. Hamas, which had emerged during the Intifada, projected the Oslo Accords along with other Palestinian factions. In 1995, following the massacre of Palestinians at the Ibrahimi Mosque in the West Bank by an Israeli extremist, Hamas carried out a series of suicide bombings. Wow. Colin, Israeli extremists. You ever hear about them? You ever hear that shit happening? I bet you you haven't. That same year, Israeli PM Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated by a right-wing Israeli, and by 1996, Benjamin Netanyahu had ascended to power, pushing the situation towards further violence and unrest, leading to the second intifada in 2000 that erupted after hopes for a two-state solution were crushed. So, any thoughts so far? No. I mean, I'm part of the course. Yep. For Israel. Um, well, we continue. Hamas has often been blamed for the failure of peace talks and the Israeli government's refusal to compromise. However, the group was far from the first to use suicide bombings. Palestinian Islamic Jihad introduced the tactic in 1980. 
1979, <laughs> with several groups contributing to similar attacks throughout the 1990s. The peak of these attacks occurred during the Second Intifada in the early 2000s, while Hamas was responsible for 39.9%, Fatah, Islamic Jihad, and especially the Marxist Leninist Socialist Organization, the PFLP, accounted for the remainder. Hamas's violence came in direct response to Israel's own wantonly violent policies, including continued settlement expansion, apartheid, and, of course, an ongoing military occupation, all of which played significant roles in derailing the peace process. Even as armed Palestinian groups were crushed in the West Bank, especially during Israel's Operation Defensive Shield, which probably was offensive, they like their oxymorons over there, um, Hamas's resilience in Gaza compelled Israel to rethink its approach. By 2005, Israel withdrew from Gaza, but not before securing control over the West Bank, restructuring and repurposing the Palestinian Authority's security forces to ensure their coordination with Israeli occupation forces. Right? So mm -hmm. that's, that's, I think, the thing. The Palestinian Authority security forces like had to work in coordination with the IOF pretty much, right? right? So successive Israeli governments, including those led by Netanyahu's Likud party, continued expanding settlements in direct contravention of international law, all while placing the blame on Hamas for stalled progress. The narrative of a so-called Hamas-Netanyahu radical alliance, promoted by some liberal Zionists, centers less on Hamas's actions and more on deflating responsibility from Israel's policies. So, I guarantee you, Miss Daniela Weiss was a part of that, no? So, sure. don't trust the liberals. They will betray you. <laughs> In the post 9 11 era, Islamic extremism became a convenient boogeyman for Israel in 2008. Netanyahu himself stated the September 11 attacks were beneficial for Israel because it had found a new equivalent. Uh, to the Soviet Union in Iran and to the PLO in Hamas, arming itself with two new public relations tools. The first was to assert that the Palestinian Authority was not a rational negotiator for peace, and the second was to frame Israel's own Al-Qaeda-type problem using the specter of Islamic terrorism as a distraction. So, even as... Make sure I'm on... Uh... There we go. Borrowing from the battle-tested strategy of the post-9-11 Bush administration, today Netanyahu claims that October 7th was Israel's September 11th. It's the same playbook used to advocate twice for U.S. military action in Iraq. However, Al-Qaeda was a transnational terrorist organization whose founders were armed and trained with CIA assistance to counter Soviet-backed government in Afghanistan. The only real commonality between Al-Qaeda and Hamas is they share a common faith, Sunni Islam. However, each organization has distinct goals and origins. Al-Qaeda emerged as a transnational answer to the U.S. wars in the Middle East, whereas Hamas was, focused, was founded with a focus on Palestinian national liberation. And they're trying to conflate the two even now. So, but... I will let In Lakesh finish some of this up for us. In the end, while Hamas may have played a role along with every other Palestinian armed movement in allowing Israel to justify its hardline stance, it was not the primary reason for the failure of the Oslo peace process. The roots of that failure lie in a combination of factors, including Israel's strategic decisions, continued occupation, US unconditional support for Israel, and the broader dynamics of Palestinian resistance. If Hamas was the real problem, why is Israel still building settlements, killing civilians, and tightening its control over the West Bank, a territory where the Palestinian Authority preaches nonviolence and cracks down on its own people who resist Israeli occupation through force? <laughs> this is because the ideology really doesn't matter. It is the fact that Palestinians are using armed resistance against the expansion of a settler colonial project on their land, as Palestinians have been doing since the Arab Revolt of 1936 and even before that. In fact, every major Palestinian political party 
whether they be secular nationalists, Marxists, or Islamists, are considered to be terrorist groups by Israel, with the current exception of the mainstream branch of Fatah, which rules the Palestinian Authority. Yet prior to the Oslo Accords, Fatah was the primary group they blamed for a lack of peace. Now, as this series is focused on whether Israel really helped to create and prop up Hamas, there are still other questions that need answers. So be sure to stay tuned for part three of this series, where we'll delve deeper into Netanyahu's agenda after the conclusion of the Second Intifada and the Qatari aid money's role in this conflict. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more in-depth analysis. Yeah, do what he said. Um, closing thoughts, Care Bear? Uh, yeah, I did, but it's, it's sorry, it escaped me for a second. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't know, like. How can I say this so we don't get <laughs> Um, I don't know. I think for me, it's the idea of, well, as you said, I think one, the first thing is how, well, I, 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 I think at the core of it is essentially the idea of Arabs are the enemy. Like, Arabs are savages. They don't know any better. And, and like, Islam is a radical con con religion and, like, all of this stuff. You know, especially that came out of 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think has fed into a lot of kind of what we're seeing now. Um, but, you know, but it's interesting in just, I, I honestly, I never thought about it in terms of how Al-Qaeda and Hamas have been completed, you know, into more or less synonymous thing where they're not. Mm -hmm. And the idea that Hamas is strictly meant to, is a resistance group, uh, like contrary to what we hear mainstream media, but it's a resistance group to support the liberation of Palestine. Um, you know, I think which and I kind of relate this, you know, just to my own history, you know, like in terms of resistance. Like, and I have to wonder, like I do wonder about this. How is it, well, I say this with a grain of salt, but how is it that people can somewhat understand our need for resistance as Black people? And again, I'm saying that very loosely because I think while they might say they agree or understand the inferior, I'm sure, like, heart-wise, they don't, but I'll well, give people grace. A lot uh, of these people how is that it are people can... getting Hold this on, wrong, how is it... go ahead. Like, how is it that people are able to accept, seemingly, my resistance, or at least my ancestors' resistance, but not necessarily of those in Palestine? Yeah, well, I think anyone's resistance, like, they they compartmentalize that. These are the same people with the gads and flags on the wall. These are the same people who, you know, still talk about give me liberty or give me death. Like, it's you know, a rallying cry, yet when people actually make that cry, you know, I, I fuck them, you know, make mm -hmm. them disappear. Like, and it just shows people don't care unless it actually applies to them, you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I hear people down here, well, it's like, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd let, let them take one foot on my land, you know, like, well, how about if 80% of your land has been taken from you? What then? You know? Right. Like, plenty of AKs to go around, friend. You know? 
So, like, I think there will be a lot more people willing to throw the resistance flags up in this regard if it was happening to them. But because it's some, you know, brown people in the Middle East, they just tend to not care, unfortunately. So, yeah, I mean, and they don't really like the, the armed resistance your people had either, Colin, if I'm not mistaken. No, I know, but that, that's what I'm saying is that people right. seemingly understand that. Yeah. But whether or not they truly do is another thing. Yep. Well, as always, talking about these things are why we're demonetized. So you can go to kodashfee.com slash Indie News Network or scan that QR code on your screen. And, you know, send us some monies if you're so inclined. We appreciate it. Any little bit helps. But if you can't do that, you know, don't forget to like and subscribe if you aren't already. You know, hit that share button. Send us to your friends, your families, your pets. See if they are able to read. I don't know. You know, <laughs> like you might have the thing set up for the kitties to watch, but make sure to leave a comment. Let us know what you thought. We do actually read them and help Ian and get to 3K. Otherwise, thanks for watching.